Our next speaker is up. Thanks again, Clayton, Todd, Josh, for sharing some good information. Now, folks, um, we're fortunate to have Patrick Haley here. Patrick is the president and CEO of Wireless Infrastructure Association, WIA. Big job. WIA represents over 140 companies that develop, build, own, and operate the nation's wireless infrastructure. Prior to joining WIA in 2022, Patrick was Senior VP of Policy and Advocacy and General Counsel at U.S. Telecom. In addition, Patrick was a partner at the communications law firm of Wilkinson, Barker, and Narr. Patrick also served at the FCC in a numerous roles, including legal advisor to the FCC chairman and two bureau chiefs. Patrick graduated magna cum laude from Catholic University of America, Columbus School of Law. He has received a Bachelor of Arts from the George Washington University Elliott School of International Affairs. So folks, please welcome Patrick Haley. Thank you, appreciate it. Well, good afternoon, it is great to be here. I have uh, been the CEO of WIA for about eight months now, and uh, it's been a really fantastic ride. I've really enjoyed every second of it so far. Um, we recently had a retreat, senior leadership retreat team, and we were talking about what is WIA, who are we, what do we do? And I asked the team, you know, what is, wh why do we exist? And at the end of the day, we got down to effectively connecting everyone, everything, and every organization everywhere. So pretty simple, easy uh, objective for us to achieve. And it's really, you know, very idealistic, um, but it's true. You know, listening to some of these presentations about everything that our industry enables, it really is true, and that is why we exist. Obviously, uh, our day-to-day -day activities are not necessarily as grand as that vision, but that is what we do, and that's what all of you do, and that's why it's such a nice organization to, to be able to represent the companies and people in this room. Uh, I was recently in Barcelona, uh, Mobile World Congress, that's a big conference, about 90,000 people. Some other people in the room were also there as well. And um, what's amazing about that event is you really do see where this industry is and where it's going. At one point I was wearing some sort of augmented reality goggles playing dodgeball against two people in another city in some other part of Europe. Um, we won. We were the only team to win apparently that day from the floor uh, in Barcelona. Um, but it was really interesting. Um, and you really see what this industry is and where it's headed, um, and it's amazing. And at the end of it, I was thinking about it as I was going home. All of that stuff, inter interesting as it, as it may be, um, none of it's possible without the infrastructure that you know, WIA's members deploy every day across the country and, and across the world. Um, so what does WIA do? We wake up effectively every morning thinking about what we can do to make it easier for our members, for those of you in the room, to build the networks, maintain the networks, operate the networks um, that make all of that possible. And we literally wake up every morning thinking to ourselves, what can we do on behalf of our members to make it easier for those companies to succeed? And I mean that sincerely. We do that through our advocacy at the state and federal level. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. We do that by uh, the training uh, and workforce development efforts uh, that we work on uh, every single day. We do that through thought leadership and by telling the industry story to the public, to policymakers at all levels of government, um, and through our communications efforts. Um, and, you know, the amount of infrastructure, we recently did, we had IGR research do a study for us on the amount of infrastructure that's, that's out there. Uh, and some of these numbers are frankly a little conservative because it doesn't include government-owned networks or municipal uh, networks that aren't commercial. Um, but if you, if you look at some of those numbers, you know, almost 150,000 towers, 210,000 sites, 450,000 small cell nodes, 
I think the most important number, and this is just in the wireless infrastructure space, not all of the adjacent jobs that all that infrastructure enables, over 400,000 jobs. Uh, it's pretty impressive. Um, and that's just you know, the core infrastructure that contributes to all the applications and everything else that you've been hearing about today that powers the entire economy. It's all possible because of a massive amount of investment. So since 2018, $120 billion invested uh, by the wireless industry into wireless networks. $35 billion just in 2021 alone, and over $40 billion, closer to $50 billion last year. Um, you've heard a lot about the investment cycles today and where we are and all that, but that's a massive amount of money, right, just on the wireless side. Uh, in 2021, the entire broadband industry as a whole, if you count cable, fiber, um, all the different technologies, was about $80 billion. Um, and it's, you know, the number's going to be, I think, the highest we've probably ever seen at the end of, uh, at the end of 2022. $635 billion capital investment over the lifetime of the industry. And sometimes I just have to pause for a second because we get so focused on the issues of today and what we're doing that um, you have to just take a second to think about those numbers. They're staggering. Um, and it really, truly does enable literally everything we do in our economy. Um, and I also think about the massive federal infusion of capital that we're talking about for broadband, right? People talk about the BEAD program. It's $42.5 billion. The wireless industry will have invested more than that in 2022 alone, just in private capital. And so what has that enabled? Over 99% of Americans have a choice of 4G LTE service from three or more wireless providers today. Um, that's pretty incredible, from the nationwide providers, from regional carriers as well. And 5G already reaches 315 million Americans. And we've done that twice as fast as the 4G deployment. So we've got you know, all of the major carriers obviously deploying C-band spectrum, 3.45 gigahertz spectrum, 2.5 gigahertz, um, you know, a significant amount of deployment over the last couple of years, and last year in particular, based on those investment numbers. We have DISH, right, deploying right now uh, a nationwide network uh, with, with deployment obligations and milestones that they have to hit over the next couple of years, and they're very actively working on it. We're also seeing the cable industry, right? The cable industry is losing subscribers left and right from their traditional video business. So their biggest growth opportunity to right, right now is the wireless industry. Mostly that's through reselling an existing carrier's network, but they're all starting to also use their own spectrum, CBRS spectrum, a lot of Wi-Fi. Uh, and looking at future spectrum opportunities. And so we're seeing a lot of growth from the, from the cable companies as well. And we're seeing average speeds of 128 megabits per second. That's really fast, right? When I was at the FCC, this wasn't that long ago, right? I started at the FCC in 2010. The National Broadband Plan came out, it was a big deal. Uh, one of the major efforts of the, of the Obama administration's FCC was to produce a National Broadband Plan in 2010. They defined broadband at the time as four megabits down, one megabit up. That was 13 years ago, right? Now, a lot of people were outraged that they would define it that low. Nonetheless, that's what they considered broadband. Uh, then they had a big you know, auction for you know, getting broadband deployed to rural areas, and they set the standard at 10-1, which was a big deal for the FCC. And then I was working for Tom Wheeler. By the end of his administration in 2014, we decided that 25.3 was what we were going to define broadband as. So, you know, that's seven years ago. We're now averaging, this is average speeds of 128 megabits per second on a 5G wireless network, which is, you know, more than enough broadband for pretty much anybody to do everything they want to do at any particular time. Um, and we're getting speeds of one, two gigabits per second as well. I was uh, in Baltimore, I live in DC, I was in Baltimore at M&T Stadium. They have a 5G millimeter wave network deployed nearby, pulled out the phone and I was getting two gigabits per second down on my mobile phone. This is incredible. Um, and at the same time, we seem to have some people second guessing the ability of wireless to get the job done in a variety of different uh, places. Uh, there's simultaneous excitement for 5G and all that it enables, but there's also some, that, some second guessing. So for example, uh, the federal broadband uh, dollars that are being spent right now, the BEAD program, $42.5 billion, uh, and other programs as well. The Treasury Department is, is implementing what's called the Capital Projects Fund, $10 billion program. 
they define broadband as 100 down, 100 up. They refuse to fund anything but fiber. This federal program defines a priority broadband project as any project that will provide end-to-end -end fiber optic facilities to each end user. I love fiber. I have fiber in my house. I hope you all do too, because it's a great technology. And a lot of our members deploy fiber. But the idea that, or as my friends at the Fiber Broadband Association, and I love them, but the idea, if it's not fiber, it's not broadband, come on. I'm not buying it. Uh, I just don't think that's realistic. And uh, I, I will bet on wireless uh, every day of the week. Uh, was in a meeting recently with a policymaker who basically suggested that 5G was being overhyped, right? That we had sold 5G and its ability to deliver more than it actually has. Um, and it made me start to think about, like, why does, why does this person have this perspective? And in some ways, it's not surprising, right? With 4G, if you look at some of these headlines from 2010, there's always this, it's the nature of wireless technology. There's always, uh, a perception at the beginning of a new G, if you will, that it's really not that much of a difference from the prior G. Except then when you went from 3G to 4G, once you actually had LTE and once you had the, the, the current version of the standard out there deployed and you had the smartphone, it fundamentally transformed the way people live and do business and, do, and um, you know, conduct their lives. So you went from that to the ways that 4G will change your life. And, and it's changing the world. And it really, truly has. We haven't seen that yet with 5G. We kind of have, right? 128 megabits per second on your, on your cell phone is, is pretty incredible. The, amount, the speed you're getting and the capacity uh, is nothing like we'd ever seen before, even on a 4G network. But we haven't fundamentally seen our lives transform the way 4G did, but it's going to happen. Right? There's no doubt in my mind that the 5G capabilities we heard uh, Bob Page was talking earlier about, you know, version 18 and 19 of the standard, once you have the full 5G capability rolled out over the next few years, we, our, our lives will have been fundamentally transformed in a way that we recognize the way 4G fundamentally transformed our lives. The first version of that, we've heard a lot about it today, is fixed wireless access. We did a report called the Fixed Wireless Network op Networking Opportunity, or Network Opportunity rather, because we wanted to be able to tell the story about what fixed wireless is doing already. 90% uh, of net broadband additions in 2022 were fixed wireless to the home. Um, now, the vast majority of broadband to the home continues to be uh, cable and fiber, but fixed wireless is absolutely replacing DSL anywhere where there's not uh, fiber or a cable connection. And it's actually starting to compete uh, with, with the traditional wireline technologies. Um, and there's different flavors. You heard, um, I remember if it was Todd or Josh earlier talking about uh, fixed wireless to the home, and it was Todd, and we showed the video of, the, of, a, of a WISP, right, and a stand of, of purpose-built fixed wireless network. You see a lot of that, but we're also seeing T-Mobile and Verizon in particular, U.S. Cellular as well on the, on the more of the rural markets, deploying fixed wireless uh, using 5G spectrum. Uh, their C-band spectrum, 3.45 gigahertz spectrum, 2.5, et cetera. Um, and we really are seeing fixed wireless truly explode onto the market uh, as an alternative. Um, and you know, I, in my view, I don't think that's um, a one-time thing. There's different perspectives, right? If you look at the carriers, AT&T seems to be focused a little bit more on fiber to the home with fixed wireless as a near-term solution. AT, excuse me, T-Mobile and Verizon absolutely focus on fixed wireless and they're marketing it. The, the, the time I knew it was real is when I was at home and I saw a Comcast commercial talking about why T-Mobile's fixed wireless to the home service wasn't sufficient. That's when I realized, okay, this is, this is an actual competitor in the marketplace. We'll see if two years from now all this money gets spent, we've got fiber to every, every home, if fixed wireless goes away, or if it continues to stay uh, as a, in the market as a real competitive alternative. So all that success, all that investment, all that deployment, um, you know, everything that it's enabled, you need access to capital. You need constant innovation and, and R&D by the providers. But you also need a policy environment and a regulatory environment that enables uh, the providers to deploy and, and all the companies to build and operate and maintain that infrastructure. And that's what WIA does. At the state level, at the federal level, we are working diligently to advance policies that promote our industry and honestly spend a lot of time pushing back against policies that would inhibit our ability to deploy where we want, when we want. So I'm gonna walk through just to give you a sense of 
things that you may not feel every day and be involved in every day, but that hopefully you all are all indirectly benefiting from, from the advocacy that we're doing. And uh, actually, I want to introduce Mike Saperstein. Raise your hand. Mike Saperstein is our Senior Vice President of Government Affairs. He started about, what, a month ago? Two, Two months ago? Well, time flies. <laughs> Uh, Mike had actually been at PCIA back in 2010, so he knows the industry. Um, so walk through some of the things that we've been working on. Um, at the federal level, it's, look, it's a divided Congress. It's a 51-49 Senate, 222 to 209, I think, in the House. Really tight, really political, not a lot of big progress likely to be made. Um, and so that's an interesting environment for us to be working in. Some of the areas where I do think there's agreement, though, actually bipartisan, is on the need for um, you know, permitting uh, reform. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, oversight going on right now of all of this federal money, these hundreds of billions of dollars that have been injected into the system to make sure it works well. On the permitting side, we've been working with Senator Thune, for example, South Dakota, and others who's been working with all the federal agencies, asking them you know, what they're doing to help uh, accelerate uh, siting on federal lands. Um, on the BEAD implementation front, uh, for example, Senator Thune wrote a letter, Todd from Nate got one as well, where he was asking questions around the BEAD program, and you know, we had the opportunity to explain, we're not against fiber, we're just in favor of wireless, and we want to make sure, our message is simple, it's not one technology over the other, it's give the states the flexibility to spend the money in the way that makes sense for their state. And that's going to be a mix of fiber, and it's going to be fixed wireless as well. In the super remote areas, it might even be a little bit of satellite. Um, permitting reform, uh, there's a lot of talk about permitting reform primarily around energy issues, but there is some discussion, particularly in the House, around uh, taking some of the decisions that the FCC has made around making it easier to deploy uh, wireless infrastructure and codifying some of that into federal law, so there's some discussions going on there. Rip and replace. I, I mean, the biggest topic you'll hear in Washington right now, whatever it is, has to do with China. Um, whether it's TikTok and whether or not we should ban TikTok from all phones or uh, other national security issues, it's a heavy emphasis on China. One of them is, you know, Huawei gear in the networks, mostly in rural carrier networks. Um, they have to take it out of their network. Uh, so far, they've provided $2 billion to remove that. Uh, equipment from the networks, and there's a $3 billion shortfall. So one of the discussions going on right now is whether or not Congress will appropriate additional funds to pay those rural carriers to remove that network and replace it. What do they replace it with? Ericsson, you know, some of the traditional gear. You're hearing a lot of more discussions about open RAN technology, uh, but that funding discussion is going on. Taxation of federal broadband grants, just to give you a flavor of this, you know, $42 billion through the BEAD program, $10 billion that the Treasury Department's administering through the Capital Projects Fund. As it stands right now, uh, grantees who get those awards would have some of it subject to federal taxation. That makes no sense, right? Give a company billions of dollars to go build out a broadband network and then have 20% of it returned back to the federal government. So we're working with uh, lots of other organizations to try to get a tax fix on that issue. Big one right now is FCC Spectrum authority uh, and spectrum in general. As of this moment, the FCC, for the first time since the 90s, does not have the authority to auction spectrum. Uh, they don't have a permanent auction authority. Every now and then, the Congress has to reauthorize their authority to auction spectrum. The way that's playing out in an interesting way right now, because uh, there's no spectrum auctions on the horizon, I'll talk about that in a second, is T-Mobile, who just primarily, who bid for a whole bunch of 2.5 gigahertz licenses, uh, is being told that the FCC can't process those applications in the meantime because they don't have the authority to do spectrum auctions. It's really strange. It's, it's, it, it's getting hung up between battles between the Department of Defense, the FCC, and industry. Um, it will get re the, the authority will get reauthorized. It's just a question of when. Uh, but the practical impact right now is whether or not some of these T-Mobile licenses will be uh, given out. Last one is FCC nominations. Um, right now, there's two Republicans and two Democrats at the FCC. Much to the chagrin of the current Democratic uh, FCC chair, that really ties her hands. Um, and certain uh, activities that the chair might want to take, she's unable to take because she can't get a majority of the votes to do what she wants to do. Some people in industry might not think that that's a bad thing. Uh, it means that any sort of heavily regulatory activity that they might take uh, is not possible until they get a, a fifth commissioner. 
they had uh, a nominee for over a year and a half trying to get through the process. They finally withdrew her name to Gison uh, last month. And so we're waiting to see who the president will renominate as the fifth FCC commissioner. There's a lot of talk about who that's going to be. I don't believe any of it. Um, what I can tell you is with the FBI vetting process, with the confirmation process, with the hearings, et cetera, getting the Commerce Committee to vote for the fifth commissioner and then getting the full Senate to vote on it, uh, I'd be surprised if we have one before Q4 at best, uh, before we get a fully operational FCC. It's called dysfunctional government. Um, this is just an example of our advocacy with, with the BEAD program where we've been working with NTIA to just try to explain to them what I was talking about earlier about the need for flexibility to just allow the states to uh, pick the technology that works for them. We heard about the FAA earlier. I hear a lot about the FAA uh, I, and I understand why. Um, we asked some of our, our members for some data and you know, basic run-of-the-mill applications that normally get uh, approved within three weeks or even less are sitting there and being stuck for three months, six months, nine months, more than nine months, totally unacceptable. Um, we've met with the FAA. Uh, we've gone in there and presented some of this data. They don't deny it. I would say some of it had to do with just everybody hitting pause when we had the C-band kerfluffle with the airlines and the carriers about a year and a half ago where you just, they just stopped approving applications. It's created a backlog. Uh, we understand that they've taken some steps to tech with some new software capabilities to try to uh, speed up the process for um, uh, applications that are coming in. But there's a big backlog of a lot of applications that are stuck. We're pushing them. Effectively, what they say is we don't have the resources. Uh, we don't have a staff to handle the amount of applications that we're getting. So we're looking at this issue from a carrot and stick perspective. Uh, we're actively working right now to try to get more funding for FAA staff to hire more people uh, so that they can staff up and get these applications approved. Uh, we're also talking to the relevant authorities in DC, on the Hill, the FCC, et cetera, to explain to them what's going on and why this is a problem. Um, it's a delicate dance, I'll just tell you. you know, we're not going to go beat the FAA over the head because we need their support and we need their help. And the carriers are trying to deploy C-band spectrum still. So the last thing we need to do is you know, pick a huge fight with the FAA. At the same time, we kind of need to pick a fight with the FAA. So we're, we're working on it, I assure you. But if you have any experience, any data, anecdotes, talk to Mike, because we're having conversations with the FAA and we're trying to get that logjam uh, addressed. Uh, at the FCC, you know, section 6409 is a great thing. Co-location by right, it's a good thing. Um, you know, we have worked since the Spectrum Act of 2012 f uh, with the FCC through an order in 2014 with shot clocked and deemed granted remedies, uh, and which was upheld by the Ninth Circuit where we intervened in support of the FCC. Um, in 2020, the FCC adopted two orders. One was a compound expansion order. Effectively, it allows uh, the site, it's 30 feet out from the existing site uh, to not require the existing uh, you won't, you won't have to go through the, the process from the beginning. It's treated as just a mod and 6409 applies. Similarly, with the 5G upgrade order in 2020, we worked to get um, uh, some clarifications around when a shot clock started, for example, to avoid some gaming that was going on. Very helpful uh, uh, decisions out of the FCC. We're right now, we've intervened in court in the Ninth Circuit uh, in support of the FCC's order. This was an interesting one because Chairwoman Rosenworcel had actually, actually dissented on the order when she was a commissioner, uh, and the California League of Cities sued the FCC, and she ended up as chair of the FCC fully supporting the order that she had previously dissented on. I call that a win. Um, and we're in the court, obviously, supporting the FCC there. Other issues, spectrum. So we've heard a lot about spectrum today, right? We've heard C-band. We've heard 3.45 gigahertz, we've heard 2.5 gigahertz. This is all this amazing mid-band spectrum that's, that's made this 5G uh, rollout possible. There's no spectrum in the pipeline right now. There's no scheduled auction. And anybody who's followed this, you understand, you, you identify a spectrum band, you, figure, you go through the standards development process, you figure out a schedule for when it's gonna be auctioned, you have an auction you get the license from the FCC, then you deploy. This is a multi-year process. So it's, it's a bit concerning that we don't have any new spectrum in the pipeline. So 
you know, we're going to continue to deploy the C-band spectrum. Um, you know, the second phase of the C-band deployment will happen this year, more will happen next year. Um, and there's CBRS activity obviously going on as well. Um, but we really do need to identify that next pipeline of spectrum that's going to enable further deployment, faster speeds, more capacity for the, you know, the, what I'll call the, the full-on 5G that we're going to see going into 6G. And that process is really interesting, actually. So NTIA just announced that uh, they're seeking comments to develop a national spectrum strategy. Those comments are due April 17th. We will file comments. Clearly, the carriers and other interested parties will file comments. Really, the debate is going to be a couple of different things. Which bands, you know, 4 gigahertz, 7 gigahertz, 9 gigahertz, 12 gigahertz, spectrum that five years ago we never would have thought about for commercial mobile broadband or fixed broadband. Um, which bands, and then how is it going to be allocated? Is it going to be the model we've known for 4G and mostly for 5G, which is licensed commercial exclusive use? That's what the carriers want, right? They want, they want to have access to know that this is my spectrum, I control it, this is my license, exclusive use access. On the other side of that debate, you've got public interest organizations, the cable industry, who, which is much more in favor of kind of a shared CBRS style model. Um, a lot of debates right now in DC about whether or not the CBRS shared spectrum model is a great success or a great failure. It depends who you ask. Um, the cable industry, uh, others from the public interest community will say that it, it is successful uh, and that that's the model we need to look towards to the future because it's just too hard at this point to have, there's not enough spectrum. It's too hard to do it with exclusive use spectrum. That's a big debate. The other debate is between the Department of Defense, which has more spectrum than anybody else, and other federal agencies, including the FCC, uh, where the carriers are pushing DOD to give up more of their spectrum, relocate, move somewhere else, and DOD is saying, can't do it, impossible, the spectrum's too important, I need it for my radars, et cetera. So there's gonna be a lot of discussions around federal versus commercial, exclusive license versus um, shared spectrum. You know, at the end of the day, we'll put up antennas on an infrastructure and deploy whatever, whatever it is that's you know, being made available, but that's gonna be a big, big, big debate uh, going forward. Bead, I'll talk just briefly, um, it's a lot of money. We're spending a fair amount of time talking with state broadband offices and NTIA about the, the value of fixed wireless as a solution in addition to fiber, using both technologies, as I said. Uh, one really wonky issue that we've been weighing in with them on is called the extremely high cost per location threshold. I can't believe I just said it out loud. I apologize that I did. Um, but it, it matters. It's this, this concept that NTIA made up that says you as a state have to set a threshold. And if the, per, the cost per location is above a certain threshold, then you can do something other than fiber. If it's below that threshold, you have to do fiber. You can't even consider a fixed wireless application. We think that makes no sense. Why would you do that, right? Have a process, decide which technology makes sense, but don't create artificial thresholds that just put the thumb only on fiber to the home. Let's do, let's do all the technology. Build America, buy America. This administration has two competing uh, agendas. Uh, one is get broadband to every single home. Another is have all of that infrastructure built in America by American companies, sourced by American companies. You can't do it, right? Uh, fiber, the, the actual optical cable, a lot of it is made here in America. But when it comes to the electronics that light it up, and when it comes to a lot of the electronics that make the, the wireless networks go, you just can't have it all be built right now in America. Uh, and so what I think will end up happening is that the administration will realize this and provide waivers as necessary, but it is something we have to pay attention to. Um, a lot of debates over broadband maps. How accurate are they? The big issue right now is when will this money flow? And the money won't flow until the NTIA uh, decides that the FCC's maps are good enough to determine where the money should be targeted, and that, that determines how much money each state gets. Um, most likely, June of this year, NTIA will say the maps are good enough based on what the FCC's data tells us in terms of how many homes are unserved or underserved. We will now tell each state what their allocation is. Here you go. Uh, but there's a lot of debate going on about when do we think the maps are good enough, because it will affect potentially significantly how much money one state gets versus another. Uh, so, uh, Josh was talking about space. That's the biggest topic at the FCC right now, satellites. Uh, tons of debates. They just, the chairwoman announced that we're creating a new bureau called the Space Bureau. 
It's fun. You can have your FCC Space Bureau jacket. That'd be pretty cool. Um, <laughs> um, but one of the, the hot uh, proceedings right now, they just announced a rulemaking on it, is direct satellite to device connectivity. There's different models of this. Uh, some uh, are going to be reusing mobile spectrum. So T-Mobile announced a deal with SpaceX to effectively SpaceX will be able to reuse T-Mobile spectrum. Um, some are just doing literally, there's a Qualcomm model um, where it's just a satellite directly to the phone using satellite spectrum. It's not going to be 5G like it's mostly at this point text messaging, super low data, but there's definitely a lot of discussion around direct satellite to cell phone connectivity um, just with our existing devices, and that's gonna get a lot of attention at the FCC and in, and in general. Uh, other stuff, floodplains, there's an NPRM, Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, sorry to use FCC speak, uh, that's where I come from, um, that would, effectively it's trying to implement an, an executive order that was from the Obama administration around more or less uh, m more administrative process issues when you're doing uh, infrastructure in a floodplain. Um, that's stuck because it's a 2-2 FCC. We'll see if that ever sees the, the light of day. We'll have time to comment, but it's potentially problematic depending on what that language looks like. Finally, is pole attachments. Um, doesn't sound like the most exciting thing in the world, but there's a whole lot of poles out there and a lot of people need access to those poles to deploy broadband and there's a debate at the FCC around who pays for new poles when you need uh, to replace them. Uh, so that's another hot topic. States, just want to flag, we have, we have lobbyists on the ground in over half the states. Um, you can see the states where we have that representation. We're working with our own lobbyists. Um, we're tracking state legislation across every single state. Uh, anything from how their state broadband programs are being designed, how the money will be spent to um, uh, you know, access to rights of way issues, small cell issues. Uh, but we do have a lobbyist on the ground in, every single, in, in over half the states, uh, and we're working very actively to uh, make sure that the legislative process works to our advantage. Some of the things we're seeing, uh, small cells, you can see at this point we've got small cell legislation based on a model that we worked with with the carriers uh, in 32 states and Puerto Rico. Active discussion in New Jersey, New York, mostly this region has legislation. It's the West that tends not to. Um, so that's a pretty active discussion. Uh, bead implementation, again, I think it was Josh who said earlier, when, if you care about how this money gets spent, maybe, maybe it was Todd, you need to be talking to the state broadband offices. Every state has a broadband office. We're obviously talking to them very actively. We're seeing things on climate change, not surprising, um, but different legislative uh, bills are popping up around mandated reporting about climate-based risk, um, mandates to transition to renewal en renewable energy. There's a bill in New York, for example, um, that we're tracking that would effectively require tower companies to provide a study as to you know, why or what their plans will be by 2030 to have renewable energy powering all their towers. Well, that's uh, aggressive, uh, and we don't think realistic, and we don't know why they would single out towers over any other business that uses power. So we're working, obviously, to educate members about what's realistic. Uh, lots of legislation on how you access uh, rights of way. Um, we're seeing some prohibitions. There's a couple in this region that were proposed, but I don't think are going anywhere uh, in Tennessee and Kentucky around setback from schools in one instance or inhabitable building or outdoor congregation space. Uh, a lot of this tends to come from concerns over RF. As you know, we're constantly fighting and pushing back against the notion that 5G is gonna do bad things. Um, but we're actively uh, working at the state level to try to push back on some of these things. There are other things too where, for example, in the state of California, the state has proposed that the California Public Utility Commission should be in charge of and directly regulate uh, broadband providers, including mobile providers. And I gotta tell you, that's a bad idea. We don't need the regulatory utility commission that regulates gas and water being in charge of the mobile broadband industry. It's a highly competitive industry uh, that's reacting to consumer demand, and it would be a negative impact on the industry and therefore a negative impact on all of us if we were to have state public utility commissions be in charge of broadband connectivity. Uh, so even things like that, we are, we're actively working on. The B timeline, I'm just going to flag here, uh, was discussed earlier. Where we are in the process right now is we have all this money. States don't yet know how much they're each going to get. 
They will probably find that out in June or July of this year if the schedule holds. States then have 270 days to submit a proposal to NTIA explaining what they're going to do with their money. Um, and th then NTIA receives that proposal and then has to take the time to review it and uh, ultimately approve it, which means obviously we're not going to actually see any money flow really from this until 2024. And then we've got a, you know, a four-year cycle once that money does actually start to flow. So we're, in the, we're in the, still in the beginning stages of this, of this whole process. I uh, want to just conclude by talking a little bit about some of our, our non-advocacy work. As I mentioned, the work that we do on your behalf is advocacy, and we do a ton of it uh, with a relatively lean team in every state across the country, at the FCC, at NTIA, at the Bureau of Land Management, at the FAA, um, wherever we need to be. Um, but we're also spending a lot of time, and I'm spending a lot of time, working on training and workforce development in our industry. Um, the first area uh, is our TIRAP program, the Telecommunications Industry Registered Apprenticeship Program. Um, we have been running the TIRAP program as the Department of Labor's national sponsor of the registered apprenticeship for the telecommunications industry for several years now. We have 89 companies as of today who are participating in the apprenticeship program. Uh, we have over 4,000 apprentices in the pipeline. Um, and it's a really phenomenal program um, where we are working with employers. They tend to be um, probably some of the companies in this room. I'm sure there are some of the companies in this room. Um, they tend to be smaller, you know, not some of the huge nationwide companies. But we're creating uh, training for, it's, it's interesting, existing employees. Sometimes it's an employee that's been at a company for one week, right, and wants to learn and get trained up on a particular skill or occupation. Sometimes it's somebody who's been at a company for 20 years and wants to advance their career, 10 years, and wants to advance and get new skills. Um, so we started out with, logically, focused on more of the traditional tower-focused um, jobs, tower climber, Tower Technician, Tower Technician 2, Tower Foreman. Um, we then went and branched out, and now some of the occupations include RF Engineer, Aerial and Underground Utility Installer, Broadband Technician, um, et cetera. So we now have 15 different occupations that have been approved by the Department of Labor. We will work with you to help you on the administrative side of all of this. You know, setting up an apprenticeship program, I, I have a much greater appreciation for it than I ever did before I started this job. You know, I think people hear, ah, apprenticeship, internship, what's the difference? No, an apprenticeship is a really specific thing that has rigor, that has, you know, uh, earning while you're learning with a, an assigned mentor to, to uh, the work that you do. Going back to some of the stuff Josh talked about earlier, there's a clear mentorship approach to it. And you come out of there with, with a new occupation, a new skill that you didn't have, uh, which is hopefully part of your career path. So we would love to have more, more companies. We're at 89. I'd like to get to 100 by the end of the year. So if you're not part of TIRAP and you want to be part of TIRAP, please talk to us because we'd love to work with you. We even have some funding that we get from the Department of Labor that we can provide to you to help with some of your costs. Uh, and I really do thank those companies who are supporting us on that. Uh, training tech, we, we have over 40 courses, uh, some of them e-learning, some of them in person, where we're uh, providing uh, training to uh, employees at companies in our, in our industry, love to do more of that. And then finally, we're working with a lot of uh, state governments. We have a, particularly, we started this in Ohio, but it's expanding to other states across the country, where we're playing the role of industry intermediary as the industry lingo, where we work with the state, to use Ohio as an example, we work with the lieutenant governor in Ohio, uh, and we work with industry in that state, and we work through the Ohio State University with several uh, regional two and four year schools uh, to develop training on the jobs that the industry in that state has identified that they, ha they have a need for, whether that's, you know, again, RF engineer, fiber splicer, et cetera. Um, and it's been really good. And we're getting a lot of people trained up, and they're coming through that process, and then they're, they are broadband professionals. They're ready to be hired. Um, I think, yeah, Josh earlier mentioned some of our programs. One we just launched last week with Ashland College in, in Ohio, where we're literally training individuals who are incarcerated uh, in, in uh, 
while they're still incarcerated about 5G and, we're, and they're doing 5G 101 so that they come out and they're interested in, in, in trying to get a job. And we think that's important to try to give back. Uh, we work with the Department of Labor through a program called VETS, where transitioning military members and their spouses identify you know, different types of things that they're interested in. And if communications is one of them, through WIA, we then try to coordinate with uh, businesses in our world who are looking to hire and who are interested in hiring, hiring veterans. So these are all really important things. I think that our emphasis on uh, workforce is really important. Um, it's, it's good for the industry. It's good for our reputation as an industry and as an organization, which is always helpful then when we go in and try to work with somebody at the state or federal level and they can say, oh, that's WIA. That's that industry that's really working to try to make sure people are... Uh, are trained up. There's some uh, information on where you can find more information on that. I want to talk about WWLF for a second. I, I've got, there's so many women in this room right now. That, 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 that hopefully, I won't get in trouble. It's great, right? Like, it's really great to see the amount of women in our industry that are, are, that are here today. Raise your hand if you're a member of WWLF. Love it. So good. It's, it's one, of the, one of my favorite things that we work on. We did an event in uh, DC in February where we had acting chairwoman, the first chair, female chair of the FCC, Mignon Clyburn. That's Narda Jones, current chief of staff, and a, and a bunch of industry, uh, women leaders in our industry telling their story. Um, and this is important to me, it's important to our organization, to our board, uh, about trying to take steps in which we can get more women uh, in our industry at every level, from the, the you know, uh, entry level jobs to the C-suite. Um, and it's something that, that we care a lot about and we're gonna, keep, we're gonna keep working on. We care about diversity in general in our industry. We have a supplier diversity committee. We'll have a supplier diversity uh, summit at our conference, uh, and I do think that that's important that we take steps to uh, try to diversify our industry and create opportunities. Speaking of which, this is the last thing I'll say, uh, ConnectX, May 8th through the 10th in New Orleans, there's Jazz Fest the week before, if you like music, the weekend before, Thursday through Sunday. Uh, we will have three great days of events uh, and speakers uh, from uh, um, our, our keynote list. I, I'm really excited to hear. We've got you know, senior people from Verizon, from uh, AT&T, from all of the uh, major tower companies, from US Cellular, from Charter, to hear the cable perspective, um, and a lot of great sessions planned. Uh, and a lot of fun that we're going to have as well. So I hope that you all will come to New Orleans uh, and have a good time with us. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions or happy to be done. Done. Thank you.